Hi, everybody. I want to thank you for coming to watch my talk, and I especially want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give the talk. It's unfortunate that we couldn't be doing this in person, but I am very happy that the organizers were able to pull this off virtually. So the title of my talk is, Where Does a Tool User Stop and the World Begin? And I wanted to pose this somewhat provocative question because I want to challenge you to think about where are the boundaries of a cognitive or a sensory motor system? Is it just the brain and the way the brain works? Does it also include the brain plus the body? Or in some instances, can it also include the sensory motor system? Can it also include uh, aspects of the world, such as a tool? One reason I find tools so fascinating is that they can augment the human body and let the user do things that would otherwise be impossible. For example, cutting down a redwood tree or washing a window on the second story floor. And I think that this raises very interesting questions about uh, the bodily experience during tool use. In fact, the title of my talk was inspired by a, a quote or a question raised by the late Gregory Bateson about a blind person using a cane. And what Gregory Bateson posed was, where does a blind person stop and the world begin? Does it stop at their hands, maybe the tip of the cane, maybe halfway up? We can pose this very same question to sighted tool use. For example, thinking back to our window, window washing example, where does the window washer start and where does the window washer stop during tool use? Are the boundaries of a sensory motor system as just his body? Does it also include the tip of the window washing rod? Or perhaps does it extend to include the entire thing? So I think that the most commonly used term when thinking about perhaps the integration of a tool into some kind of a body representation is embodiment. And how I will define embodiment here is the integration of a tool's dynamic and geometric properties with sensory motor body representations in order to extend what can be acted on and perceived. So the effects of tools on sensory motor body representations have been studied for about two decades. For example, there's a lot of research looking at this um, multi-sensory spatial representation right around the body called parapersonal space. And it turns out that in monkeys, but also in humans, when they use a tool, this multi-sensory interface between the body and the environment actually extends out and encompasses the tool that's being used. And there's also some more evidence that's pretty, maybe more directly related to sensory motor body representations, such as uh, changes in reaching kinematics during tool use, or my dissertation research, which was on how tool use changes somatosensory perception. And what I and many others have found is that if you measure, let's say, uh, the perceived distance between two points of touch on the arm before and after tool use, the actual perception of distance changes in such a way as to mirror what we would expect would happen if, after using a tool, their arm representation has become longer. So I think that this research is really interesting, but I think it does have some shortcomings conceptually uh, that have really not been addressed because they're very hard to address. For example, are these effects the results of geometric extension, like I talked about before with the window washer, or just distal control, the ability to control the, uh, the end of the tool? And these are just modifications uh, of the sensory motor system necessary to do so. You might also ask whether this is embodiment or perhaps just merely motor adaptation. So we know that if you adapt someone to using a force field, that changes uh, tactile processing as well as proprioceptive processing of the arm. So perhaps these results are just due to motor adaptation. But I think the most crucial issue with these studies, including all the studies that I've done here previously, is that these effects are typically not measured during tool use. And that's where the magic of, let's say, embodiment might actually be happening but instead, these designs are typically pre and post designs where you measure the effective interest before and the effective interest after, but you don't actually know what's going on during the tool use itself. So given these limitations, 
um, we wanted to perhaps think about and investigate ways that we could address embodiment during tool use. And that led us to thinking about not just using a tool to, let's say, pick up an object, but actually sensing with tools. So if we go back to the, the per blind person navigating the world with a the cane, they're essentially using the dynamics of the tool to augment their loss of visual sense in order to create maybe a perceptual or image of the, uh, the environment. And it turns out actually that there has been about a couple of decades of research, not that, not a lot, but some looking at your actual ability to sense with tools. For example, the ability to sense surface texture and roughness through the end of a tool, or perhaps an ob the distance of an object that you're probing, or even the position of the object in external space. And this actually has important applications for feedback during telerobotic surgery. But again, we return to some s similar conceptual issues here. For example, are all of these results just distal referral or actually extension? Because in all of these cases, the touch only occurred at the tip of the tool and not along the entire tool. So there, there are actually cases of sensory extension in the animal kingdom. We just have to go outside of, let's say, the human sense. And one of my favorite examples here is uh, spiders in their webs. So you would think that maybe spiders just sit there passively waiting for prey to hit the web. But in fact, this is a very active system and the spider is plucking and pulling on the strings and this allows it to better tune into the vibrations of its web to actively sense when prey has caught it. So we can even ask the same question here, where does the spider sensory motor system end and the world begin? And I would argue in this case, we should think about the sensory motor system as in also including the web that is being actively used for, for sensing. So given this, this was a big inspiration for us to now look at, let's say, sensory extension during tool use. Made three predictions uh, that we think would at least hint at some form of sensory extension. First, the user should be able to localize touch along the entire surface of a tool. Second, the user should be able to, quote unquote, tune into the dynamics of the tool during sensing. And three, Neural processes that are used for mapping touch on the body should be repurposed for mapping touch on a tool. So we came up with a behavioral paradigm to address this first issue about localizing touch along the entire surface. And what we did was we just took a paradigm that's been used for looking at tactile localization along the body and we just applied it to localizing tactile touches along the entire surface of a tool. So in our behavioral experiments, participants sat at a table in front of a computer screen, and on the computer screen, there was a drawing of the tool that they were holding in their right hand behind the including board. And an object can be placed at one of seven different locations along the length of the, uh, of the tool. And their job was to tell us after hitting the, uh, the object where on the space of the tool they felt the touch happening. So in the pre-contact phase, they would sit there holding the rod, looking at the computer screen. And on the computer screen was that drawing. That had, and there was also a red cursor, which they, would, they could control using a trackball with their left hand. And after contact, they would move that, that cursor with the trackball onto the drawing and click. And that would tell us what their judgment about the location actually was. So what are some potential results we might expect from this paradigm? So here I'm showing you just an empty graph where on the x-axis is the actual location, on the y-axis is the perceived location, and then that gray line that you see is just the identity line, if there was a perfect correspondence between them. And we might expect that if, let's say, touch was only referred to distally, there should be no 
variation about perceived location along anywhere on the, the, uh, the rod. It should be flat. However, alternatively, if we see sensory extension, you actually should see a relationship between the actual location of touch and the perceived location of touch. In this case, it's not perfect. It's not great, but we still might expect to, uh, to see that there is some relationship. Or alternatively, there might be a almost perfect relationship between actual and perceived location. And our initial hypothesis was actually that it was, uh, that there would be sensory extension, but that it would not be perfect. So here is what we actually found in our tool use, in one tool use experiment. And contrary to what we thought, participants were extremely good at this task. In fact, their, uh, the slope of their regression line was, was not statistically significantly different from one. Uh, it was actually 0.94. And the intercept was not statistically significantly different than zero. And this is just a single experiment, but we've collected over 100 participants on uh, similar variations of this task. And if we look at in aggregate the results, we see that still we don't see that great of evidence for a difference uh, of a slope from one. The average, I think, is around 0.95 or so if we look at all of our experiments. So the mean performance in all experiments we've recorded uh, in this task is just very accurate. We think that this provides the initial support for this idea of for sensory embodiment or sensory extension of a handheld rod. So how do participants actually do this task? Because it, it's, it's trivial that there is no sensor in the rod that's being wielded, which means that the participants must be tuning into something about the dynamics of the tool during the sensing. And it's these dynamics that are conveying the location information to the user's nervous system. So we, we were interested in asking the question, what is the information used to perceive contact location uh, during tool use? One potential source of information that could be used by participants is the way that a rod resonates when it's been struck or when it strikes an object. So it turns out that there's a very close relationship between how the rod resonates and the specific location of contact along the rod. So it has different frequencies that it resonates at, which we call modes. And the amplitude and phase of these modes varies along the surface of the rod, such that any location of contact on the rod leads to a unique combination of these modes. Interestingly, this pattern is invariant across uh, all rods of uniform material and density. So while the specific material and geometric properties such as the length and the cross-sectional radius of the rod will vary and that will determine how the specific frequency, what, what the specific frequencies of these modes are. This spatial relationship that you see here, which we call these vibratory motifs, will remain the same. So theoretically, your brain might learn a feature space between these different modes, such that all it has to do to quote unquote tune in to the dynamics of the rod is just to given the, the perceived material and length and uh, width of the rod, just uh, change its expectations about what those frequencies should be and use that for sensing. So, in order to, to test whether these vibrations actually are different, depending upon location, we put an accelerometer at like by the handle of a handheld rod and had participants do the experiment, which I, which I explained uh, previously. 
And what we find is that sure enough, as expected, the pattern of vibrations uh, between different locations uh, rapid, is, uh, rapidly changes uh, depending upon where the, the location of, of contact was. So here you're seeing in blue, this is for a, a hit that is close to the hand. Well, the in orange, this for a hit that is about 20 centimeters farther away from the hand, you see that they rapidly differentiate from each themselves. So we wanted to know how quickly could the nervous system theoretically uh, already produce a code related to uh, the different contact location. So we wanted to, so we used the support vector classif classifier to decode the contact location, the one of which of the seven locations of touch on the rod were hit, um, given the vibrations. And what you can see here is that within around, let's say, 10 milliseconds, the classifier is already at 100% accuracy in terms of knowing which of the locations of contact um, were hit. So this, this could be, this is something which could be really quickly uh, identified by the nervous system. So we next wanted to know what, what would happen if we violate predictions about these dynamics. So unbeknownst to participants, uh, we gave them what we call a hybrid rod. So this is a rod where half of the rod is made of wood and the second half of the rod is made of foam. So participants had no idea that this was the rod they'd be wielding because in the experiment, they never got to see the rod. They got themselves into position to do the task and then we gave them the rod behind the including board and they started the task. And as you can see here, there's very obvious and noticeable differences between the vibrations produced when hitting or the rigid aspect of the rod and the non-rigid aspect of the rod. So what we actually found, if we look now at the, the plots for, uh, for judge location as a function of actual location, is that while perception is um, linearly, or the perceived location is linearly increasing on the rigid portion of the rod, it is remaining essentially flat on the non-rigid portion of the rod. In fact, the only reason why it's, it's perceived as being farther away uh, than the rigid portion is because participants, they told us that they just inferred it had to be. So it was just a cognitive strategy, but there was no spatial information which they could pull out of those vibrations. What you'll also notice is that the for the not for the I mean for the rigid portion, it's above this identity line. However, the, the reason for this is because participants thought they were holding onto a smaller rod than they actually were. So at the end of the experiment, we had subjects judge. Uh, how long they felt the rod was, and we can use that to normalize now uh, what would be expected for um, the contact location after doing so. And what we find here is that after normalization, now their judgments fall essentially on the... So we finally wanted to investigate the third prediction, which is that neural processes for mapping touch on the body are repurposed for matching touch on a tool. And to do that, we use EEG. And the reason we use EEG is because we were interested not just in where in the brain this might be happening, but at what stage of processing the tactile location might be extracted for both uh, touch on the body and for touch on a tool. So in a first experiment that I'll talk about, we, want, we asked how quickly do brain processes represent contact locations? So in 16 part, uh, participants, we uh, recorded their brain dynamics using EEG while we touched one of two locations along the handheld rod. And then 10 of those participants came back for a second experiment where we did, we repeated things, but now touching 
two locations on their arm. So in a typical trial of the experiment, here I'll use the example of the tool experiment, um, subjects would be seated holding onto a tool and we would hit one of the two locations on the tool and then there was this two to two and a half second retention period where they held this information about where the location was in mind. Then we would hit a, uh, the, the rod again, either at the same location or a different location along the tool. And then they would have to make their decision about whether it was in the same location or whether it was uh, same location or close and far. So, so let me let me kind of dive into what actually uh, the response was. So if the second hit was different from the first hit, they would make no response. If the second hit was in the same location as the first hit, they would make a response using a foot pedal on their left leg. But they didn't just report that it was same, they reported where the touch actually was. So if the touch was same and close to the hand, they would raise their heel. If the touch was same and far from the hand, they would raise their toe. And the important thing here is that this allowed us to not just do a same versus different task because they could be tuning into any number of things which could differentiate close versus far, but we forced them to make a spatial judgment. And importantly, we never gave them feedback so they never knew whether their judgments were correct. And we and they had never used this tool or done this experiment prior. However, regardless of this, their accuracy was almost always above 90%. So they were really good at doing the task for both the tool and obviously for the arm. So why do we choose to do this type of type of task? Well, because we are either repeating or not repeating the contact location, we can actually leverage a phenomenon called repetition suppression to, to identify features in time that are sensitive to the feature being repeated. So for example, if I were to touch, let's say, uh, your thumb, the brain responses uh, on the first hit will have some amplitude. And if I touch your thumb again, the amplitude of those brain responses for neurons that are coding for touch on the thumb are going to be smaller because I've just repeated what they're sensitive to. So it allows you to identify um, neural populations that are sensitive to, to a specific feature. So in the case of location encoding, if we, if we divide the trials up into the second hit, whether it was the same location or a different location, if, there, if for a specific response in the ERPs or the EEG, if it's not coding for location, there should be no difference between same or different. But if that particular time point is coding for, for the location, we would expect that on the second hit, if it's the same, the amplitude is going to be smaller than if that second hit was different than the first hit. So to identify uh, when we see repetition suppression, we just use this particular test called the cluster-based permutation test. And I should note here that we are focusing on the event-related potentials uh, in the ERPs or the EEG. So we focus on two large somatosensory evoke potentials in our data set. We focus on an early potential called the P50, which you typically see between 40 and 60 milliseconds after touch. And importantly, this is indexing a later stage of processing in primary somatosensory cortex uh, just before this information is sent out to other brain regions. And the second potential that we focus on is called the N80. This is typically between 60 and 100 milliseconds. And this point in time reflects processing in uh, posterior parietal cortex, secondary somatosensory cortex, and motor cortex, and their feedback 
into uh, back into primary somatosensory cortex. So it's a much larger brain network. And also importantly, this is the point in time when you start seeing evidence for more complex spatial representations of touch in the sensory motor system. So what did we actually see when we now look at uh, the repetition suppression comparing same birth different? So first I'll show you the tool results. This is for one channel called FC1. Uh, it's, and what we see is if you look at the, uh, the blue curve, the same for this, this is indexing the, the same location if it on the second time, the amplitude is smaller in the red curve, which indexes a trial corresponding to a different location. And this might be easier to, to view if we look at the difference wave between them. And the, the shaded air bar is the 95% confidence interval. And what this shows is that we find a significant cluster between 48 and 108 milliseconds. So this includes both the timing for the N80 and also a later point in time for the, the P50. So it seems to extend both over time points related to processing in S1 and more higher order processing in parietal regions. And if we look at the arm, what we see is a very similar pattern. There are some differences. So for example, it seems like the repetition suppression lasts longer in, um, in, the, arm, uh, in the arm data set for the arm experiment but it does seem to cover a very uh, similar period of time. I should also note for the tool results, which is somewhat interesting. And this is that the vibrations of the tools typically last around a hundred or so milliseconds after they've been contacted by an object or they contact an object. So what we're seeing here is repetition suppression that is actually happening and actually finishing before the rod likely stopped vibrating. So your brain really rapidly can extract this information. So this raises the question about that we pose, whether this is a similar stage of processing or not. And one way perhaps we can get at this in a very cursory way is to just look at the scalp topography of the responses. Uh, in the tool condition and the arm condition. And we, I'm showing you that here for two important time points, 52 milliseconds, which is right in the P50, and 80 milliseconds, which is right at kind of the, the peak of the N80. Oh, sorry, I, I said N80, but it's P50 for 52 milliseconds. And what you can see when just comparing by eye, the tool and arm conditions is that they look very, very similar at both stages of processing. But as I said, this is kind of a very crude way to address the question. And we would prefer actually a much more statistical way. So what? So to do so, we took several multivariate decoding approaches. And I will show you one here, which is more based upon looking at representational similarities across data sets. So here we ask, can the trial by trial suppression observed in the ARM data set be used to predict the trial by trial suppression in the tool data set. So if we think back to the trial types that we had in the experiment, we not only had different surfaces, the tool and the arm, but we also had these trial types related to whether the second hit was in the same location or the different location. So these matched across data sets. And so what you would expect is that if the patterns of brain responses are similar in the ARM and the tool data sets, that these different trial conditions should look more similar to each other than to when, if we were to compare their non-matching trial conditions. So the representational distance between matching conditions should be smaller than between non-matching conditions. And this is exactly what we found. So we did this type of analysis over several different time points from before the touch to 120 milliseconds after the touch. And what I'm going to show you is the difference between non-matching and matching uh, uh, representational distance. 
And what you see here is that we find a significant uh, effect of similarity starting at 52 milliseconds after touch. So this is right in our P50 up to and most likely beyond 120 milliseconds after touch. We also looked at the source reconstruction for the two different time points, 52 milliseconds and 80 milliseconds for both touch on the tool and touch on the arm. And here for the 52 milliseconds, what you see is that for both surfaces, you get significant suppression in both primary somatosensory and primary motor cortex. And this is pretty much what would be expected from what we know about the P50. And what you see for an N80 based time point is that now the suppression is moved not just within S1, but outside into these more posterior parietal regions which are known for making more multi-sensory representations of the body in space, as well as for sensory motor transformations, which are likely important for more higher level aspects of touch. So one thing I would like to draw your attention to is that for touch on a tool, this requires the nervous system to go from an initial temporal code into a spatial code that is used for perception. So let me unpack a little bit what I mean by that. So if you recall, the location of touch on the tool is initially encoded by the way that the rod vibrates. So you have mechanoreceptors in the hand uh, that are extremely sensitive to vibration, which are called pachinian corpuscles. And when they receive vibratory information, they spike in such a way as to match the vibratory patterns that are affecting the skin. So in this case, they'd be, they would be spiking in such a way to match the way that the rod is vibrating. And this is actually a temporal code because the location information is encoded in something that is varying across time. And this is markedly different from actually how a touch on the body is initially encoded, which is with typically with these slow adapting one mechanoreceptors, which are sensitive to indentations in the skin. And unlike the tool, it is actually the identities of which mechanoreceptors are active which is likely initially used by primary somatosensory cortex for, uh, for localizing touch on, on the body. Whereas for the, for the hand, the, the whole hand is grasping onto the tool. So likely the entire afferent population of the hand, at least the afferents that are sensitive to vibration, are active. So somehow, S1, or even the posterior parietal cortex, must rapidly transform this temporal peripheral code of location into a spatial code used for perception. Unfortunately, in our previous experiment, we weren't, we weren't able to identify the exact time when this temporal to spatial transition might happen because it's very hard to tease apart differences between suppression related to vibration and suppression related specifically to spatial coding. So in a new experiment conducted by my PhD student, Cecile Fabion, we attempted to identify when we might see more higher level uh, or evidence of more higher level spatial representations. So a very common way on the body to test uh, for higher level spatial codes is to have participants cross the hand because this puts spatial codes into conflict. One code has to do with the identity of the uh, surface that's touched. Let's say it's the right finger or the left finger. And this is probably processed very early on, let's say in somatosensory cortex. 
and another spatial code has to do with the, the position of the hand in external space, which in the cross condition, the right index finger would be across the midline sitting in left space. So in EEG, you can identify when this type of spatial coding occurs related to external space by comparing, comparing the crossed and the uncrossed conditions. So in this experiment, we did repurpose uh, this paradigm for touch on the tool. So in one condition, let's say subjects are holding the tool in their right hand and it's sitting uncrossed, so sitting in right space. So those two codes, this a higher level spatial code of position in external space and the lower level code of let's say the, it's the right tool being touched on the tip are, in, are uh, congruent. However, in the cross case, when the participant crosses the tip of the, the stick across the midline, now the codes are incongruent. They're in conflict because the right tool is now sitting or the tip of the right tool is now sitting in left space. So importantly, we can measure EEG doing an experiment where subjects are holding a tool in their right or their left hand or hitting the tip of the tool and the sticks are either uncrossed or crossed. We can compare the uncrossed and cross conditions. And what you would expect is that for periods in neural processing related to, let's say what's called, this is typically called tactile remapping of touch from a lower level spatial code of which tool was touched into a higher level spatial code about where an external space and touch happened, you would expect there to be a difference in the amplitudes. And indeed, this is what we find when we compare the crossed and the uncrossed conditions. Importantly, when we run our cluster-based permutation test that we did in our previous EEG experiment, we find preliminary results that the crossing effect uh, happens between 74 and 120 milliseconds after touch. So this is pretty much right in the time point that we identified for the N80 in the previous experiment. And this is related probably more to higher level spatial coding and, and posterior parietal cortex. I should note that this is only preliminary data. It's only 13 participants and we plan to collect much more. Um, but this is at least promising result, uh, a promising result which suggests to us that the transition from a temporal code into these spatial codes is really rapid. And importantly also, this is consistent with the literature on spatial coding for hands, which finds a crossing effect oftentimes within a similar time window. So just to conclude, we use several methods to provide converging evidence that users sense touch along the entire surface of a tool. The users tune into the dynamics of the tool during sensing. The neural processes for mapping touch on the body are repurposed for matching touch on the tool. And we suggest that the handheld tools are an integrated part of a somatosensory processing system. And in this case, when asked, where does a tool user stop and the world begin? I would probably say that the tool user stops at the tip of the tool. So I want to thank my advisor uh, who supervised these experiments, Alessandro Farney, and our collaborator, Vincent Hayward. My PhD student, Cecile Fabio, who's done a lot of this EEG work I discussed, especially the, the last preliminary experiment. And uh, master students who helped along the way, funding sources, and thank you all for listening. And I look forward to the questions you have for me on Twitter. Thank you.